It has been a brutal year for tech stocks, and the NASDAQ falling more than 30% since the start of the year. It's the worst year that we've seen since 2008. Now, the drop coming as major sector players, including Meta and Amazon, have both lost more than 50% of their market cap. Joining us now to discuss the outlook for the sector for the new year, we want to bring in Cameron Ansari, Graycroft board partner and former head of M&A at Pinterest. We also have Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel joining the conversation. Cameron, it's great to see you. So let's start with the sell-off that we've seen within the sector over the last 12 months. Looking out into the new year, do you think things are going to turn around? I mean, I, I think so. Uh, certainly, as we get into kind of Q1, Q2, uh, the valuation should come back. And I think you're going to see some of these stocks that have been oversold, particularly in January, uh, as, as investors get back into their chairs and start looking at these things and trying to figure out um, where there's opportunities. The mega cap names like Amazon, like Facebook, uh, Alphabet, Apple, uh, I think these names are going to have uh, nice years. And they're not going to you know, get back to, I think, where Amazon and, and Meta were. They're not going to double. Uh, but I think you're going to see nice gains, maybe 15, 20, 30 percent in 23, as some of these names have been certainly oversold. Cameron, Ali here. I'd love to start with the IPO market. You've identified SpaceX and Stripe as bellwethers there, I believe. Why and what were you looking for from them as they potentially move towards an IPO next year? Sure. Well, look, uh, we had about a thousand uh, or a little more than a thousand IPOs in 2021. 2022, we've seen basically half that number. So the, the market's been really quiet uh, on that front. And uh, in the tech space, I think you have a number of companies, SpaceX and Stripe, I think being the biggest and, and most anticipated, uh, probably the most IPO ready that have been thinking about it and putting things in place for, for years to be able to, to make that happen. Uh, but there are many others too. Um, you have Instacart that has announced that you know, they're going to come out. I think the CEO said, we don't need a perfect window to come out. We just need a window, an opportunity. Uh, they're not looking for the perfect valuation. You know, I think they've, they've cut their internal valuation from 40 billion down to 10. Uh, you know, and, and I think they, they're being realistic about uh, the market expectation. Now it's a business also that has $2 billion in revenue and has turned profitable. So I think they're, they're well positioned, I think, to come out. Uh, and then all the other companies that are really in the pipeline, I think, in the tech space, uh, other than Instacart, which is obviously more of a, a consumer e-commerce business, are very well positioned B2B companies. You have Databricks, which is a, a database management company, uh, Arctic Wolf, um, you know, the, these companies that are really more B2B software, uh, Gong, which is um, you know, a B2B kind of sales tool, Redis, uh, and these are all you know, well-known kind of uh, well-positioned companies that I think you're gonna see probably IPO, maybe not in the first quarter or two of the year, but, but Q3 and Q4 for sure. Uh, I think you'll see some of these names start to come out. Cameron, let's talk about the B2B space because I know you have currently backed a number of companies within that industry, Credit Key, Hopscotch, Coast, just to name a few of those. Talking about the growth opportunity for B2B going forward, how do you see that? Sure, well look, most of the companies that people are familiar with today, uh, particularly the public companies in the FinTech and payment space, uh, you think about Stripe, uh, which it was not public yet, but obviously uh, Square, now called Block, uh, PayPal, Venmo, Braintree, uh, a firm, all these companies, what they effectively do is help consumers pay a business or they help consumers pay each other. Uh, none of these companies really at their, at their core help businesses pay other businesses. Um, there are really only a couple of publicly traded companies that, that do that at scale. You have Bill.com, uh, Coupa, which is just being acquired right now by Toma Bravo um, off the public market and, and maybe Fleet Core, which is you know, trucking and, and business payments in that department. But there are very few companies at scale publicly traded that do B2B payments. And yet, certainly on the e-commerce side, when you think about digital payments from businesses to other businesses, that's a much bigger market than consumer. Um, so all these companies that today really power the, the infrastructure, the backbone of the consumer e-commerce market, which you know these days, I think, uh, I think the latest numbers is like four or $5 trillion. That's obviously massive. But the B2B market is estimated to be double that or more. Um, so I think you're seeing the opportunity really be to, to help businesses pay other businesses, particularly uh, digitally and an e-commerce kind of point of sale setting. Cameron, talk to me a little bit about M&A, because much in the way that this year has been a slow year for IPO markets, it's also been a pretty slow year for M&A. You mentioned Coupa and Toma Bravo. That's kind of one of the big marquee deals that sort of come out of the year. Yeah. What are you expecting to see in, in terms of deal making in 2023? Sure. Well, look, I've actually been surprised that there haven't been more deals uh, because you have a combination of a lot of dry powder, both in terms of the, the mega tech names like Facebook and, and, and Google and these others who have just giant cash stockpiles. Uh, and you have private equity firms with, with very large cash stockpiles of, of funds they've raised. And by the same token, you have valuation declines both in the public market and the private market. So 
uh, you know, I think the, the opportunity is really ripe right now uh, in, the, in the coming months for us to see quite a few M&A transactions happening. Uh, and look, 2022 was not crickets. I mean, there, there were some, you know, very, very large deals that were announced. Microsoft Activision, um, uh, the, uh, the acquisition of, of VMware by Broadcom, um, you know, many others. And these, these are large deals, Figma, which uh, Adobe's looking to buy. These haven't closed, obviously, and, and the Activision uh, Microsoft deal is now under uh, some FTC review. So we'll see what happens there. But, you know, 2022 had a few, you know, handful of these deals announced. But my suspicion is that going into the new year, Q1, Q2, you're going to see a, a number of additional deals announced, particularly from both private equity firms that operate in the tech space, like Tama Bravo, like Vista, like Silver Lake, and these folks, as well as uh, the large cap uh, tech buyers themselves, like Amazon and, and Salesforce and Oracle and these companies. Certainly makes sense with so many of these tech companies sitting on lots of cash. Cameron, I also want to get your thoughts on Meta because like we were discussing earlier in the show, the stock's off more than 60% since the start of the year. A lot of investors are questioning this big bet that Zuckerberg and company have made on the metaverse. Do you think we might potentially see a pivot from this in the new year? I think you might. I mean, I think the numbers even came out that, that the, the total sales of VR uh, devices uh, dropped, I think, 1% or 2% in 2022 versus 2021, uh, which is surprising, right, when you look at uh, the, the, all the buzz in that market, all the new devices that have come out. Uh, there is uh, a lot of anticipation that in the new year you're going to get competition to, to Meta in this space from uh, Apple, HTC, and Sony, uh, each of which is expected to release its own kind of VR, AR device. Uh, so you're going to see an increased competition. You're going to see, uh, you know, a market that's not really growing particularly well. And Meta has invested so much money in this space. I think in just the first nine months of 22, they lost something like $9 billion uh, on their VR division, which is called Reality Labs. So in the scheme of the overall business, this is, you know, it's not going to cripple Meta, but it's really um, hampering their overall profitability. They, they went, you know, on a quarterly basis in Q3, um, they had... 27 billion in revenue, uh, $4 billion in net income. The prior year, they'd had almost the same revenue, but double the net income. So I think the losses are mounting because of the Reality Labs division. And you can kind of attribute a lot of that, uh, you know, very clearly in, in Facebook's numbers to how they're performing. But Reality Labs is kind of a drain uh, on the overall business. And it's not generating the revenue that, that, you know, you would expect it to. Bold prediction, but we like it. We'll see whether or not it happens in the new year. Cameron Ansari, great to have you. And of course, Ali Garfinkel, thanks so much for having on here as well. Thank you.